to welcome you to our service as we remember Ken Schneider. I'm Steve Murray, Vice Son. I hope that even as you are watching this remotely, that our service will be an encouragement to you. We are here to remember the life of Ken, to remember special things about him and the way he touched our lives. The Bible says in Psalm 116, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's a reminder that every person in God's eyes is precious because we are made in his image. Ken was also precious to many people. Spouse, children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, besides the many relatives and friends that he had. In many ways, I know we will all miss him. Solomon said something that addresses a time like this in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. He wrote, It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Those words sound strange to our ears today, don't they? Who wants to go to a funeral? We'd rather go out to dinner or to a movie if we could, but certainly not a funeral. But Solomon reminds us that death is a destiny of every person. We don't live forever, and a funeral is a stark reminder of that. It is also a reminder that all of us need to occasionally think about our own death, and with it, it's a reminder to think about God and our relationship with him. Maybe for some of you, it's a reminder to get things settled between you and God before it is too late. For all of us who are followers of Jesus, though, death is a reminder of the incredible hope that we have because we know that Jesus came to die for our sins and to give us eternal life. Death is a door that opens into this eternal life. When we pass through this door at our death, we will step into a glorious eternity. Our faith will become sight. What we have hoped for and lived for, we will now experience face to face. We are here ultimately, though, to honor God. He is our maker. He sustains us right now. We are living in a time in which this is driven home with our sense of helplessness before the coronavirus. Our lives, literally, are in the hands of God. He is the one who determines the length of our days on earth. So we bow before God and acknowledge his sovereignty over all of life, including our own. Will you join with me in prayer? Father, we bow in humility and dependence before you. As we meet here today, we acknowledge the frailty and shortness of our own human lives and how it reminds us of how great you are and how small we are. We honor you because you are the author and giver of life, the sovereign God who determines the length of our days upon the earth. We thank you for the life that you gave to Ken and for the many ways he touched our lives. I pray that the remembrances we have of him, especially all of us who are family and who have been friends of his, will give us joy and peace during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. My sister Diana now is going to play the song, The Lord's Prayer, for us.
Hi everyone, I'm Scott Murray. I am the son of Violet Schneider and the stepson of Ken Schneider, and I've been asked to say a few words about Ken. You see, I've known Ken for over 40 years when he came into my life when he and my mother married while I was still in high school. So let's begin. Ken was born November 11th, 1936, to Joseph and Edna Schneider in Los Angeles. At the age of five, the family moved to Pasadena, where Ken and his younger sister, Dottie, grew up. See, Ken and Dottie, they had a wonderful life growing up in Pasadena, where they, of course, watched the Rose Parade, but they also went to the local recreation center, and they played in ping pong tournaments, and, and get this, they even learned to tap dance. And <laughs> I guess I can see Dottie tap dancing, but Ken tap dancing is, is a, I just can't make it, that one out. <laughs> Um, in addition to these activities, Ken was an avid collector of bugs and butterflies. He raised silkworms in his desk drawer, much to his mother Edna's chagrin, and even raised a mulberry tree in the front yard to feed the silkworms. The butterflies then hatched and were hopefully humanely euthanized and then delicately framed and put on display throughout the house. See, he loved the beauty of the wings. And that beauty, that love of beauty carried over into his whole life. He loved nature and Joe and Edna, his mother and father, instilled this in their kids when they took them on camping and fishing trips in the Sierra Nevadas, usually up near Bishop and June Lake area. And this love of nature carried throughout his adult life. One only needed to go into Ken's backyard and look at the multitude of trees. We used to love to get the annual batch of mandarins or uh, tangerines from his backyard during Christmas time. He took his own children on camping and fishing trips as well. After high school, Ken attended Pasadena City College and then the University of Southern California, USC, where he received a Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering. And true to the nature of Ken, he was not just content with an undergraduate degree. So he continued his education and in 1961 received a master's degree in mechanical engineering. See, so Ken highly valued education and it's not surprising upon graduating, he began working as a professor at Cal Poly Pomona where he taught mechanical engineering. And once while on sabbatical from Cal Poly, Ken even went back to USC to attain yet another degree, this time in general engineering. In 1956, Ken married Gretchen Climes, and the two were blessed with two lovely children, Tammy and Dennis. And Ken continued to enjoy the fishing and outdoors, taking his own family on camping trips, as well as teaching at Cal Poly Pomona. Ken not only had a love for his family and the outdoors, but also his students and his teaching. In 1970, as head of the mechanical engineering department at Cal Poly, Ken was instrumental in encouraging a group of mechanical engineering students to do an engineering project. As part of the engineering chapter of the Society of Automotive Engineers, the project the students chose was to build an off-road race car and then race it in the grueling Baja 500. And if any of you have been down into Baja before, and I know I have and I know my brothers have, it, it's, it's quite a place and these roads are not real great. <laughs> um, the team didn't win, but it did exemplify the motto of Cal Poly, which is learn by doing. In 1971, Ken petitioned the National Mechanical Engineering Honor Society named Pi Tau Sigma for a chapter at Cal Poly Pomona. It was granted and is one of the universities still recognized in this prestigious organization. And in the fall of last year of 2019, the Cal Poly Pomona chapter of Pi Tau Sigma won the most outstanding chapter at the National Convention. In 1990, Ken was named, not surprisingly, the Distinguished Engineering Educator by the Institute for the Advancement of Engineering. See, Ken lived the learn by doing motto in his own life. During his breaks in teaching, he successfully ran a mechanical engineering consulting business and was also a registered professional engineer. He even designed his own solar panel system for a swimming pool and spa. And he had the roof of his garage ripped off and then replaced with a pitch that actually maximized the sun exposure for, his, for the solar heating. 
1977, Ken was married for a second time to my mother, Violet Murray, who had four grown children of her own. Ken and my mom spent many happy years together going on adventures in the Sierra Nevada mountains and also taking an annual trek into the Caribbean. We had some fun rivalries in our extended family since my brother Matt and I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and our oldest brother Steve attended Stanford. And the annual Stanford USC football game is still a rivalry that I don't miss. Go Mustangs, go Cardinal. My heart aches and my prayers go out to my mother, to Ken's daughter Tammy, Ken's sister Dottie and her family, to my sister Diana and my brother Steve and Matt and also their families. Thank you, God bless you, and Ken, may you rest in peace. Every person touches people in a variety of ways, and every person has unique experiences and memories uh, of someone. I always like to take some time in a funeral service to have people share some remembrances of their relationship and time uh, with someone. But of course, since we're not all together, I can't do that. However, I do have a couple of uh, remembrances that family members have written and emailed to me that I would like to read at this time. First comes from <clears throat> Tammy, uh, Ken's daughter. She says, my memories of my dad. My dad struck gold and was so blessed when he met his wife, Vi. They have had a beautiful love story. They completed each other, and his love for her was genuine. She brought so much joy to his life. My dad had a sense of humor, was intelligent, meticulous, driven, and passionate about his work. He was a hard worker, and when he set his mind on a project, he wouldn't stop until it was done. His students staying in touch with him over the years brought him a lot of joy. He enjoyed sports in general, but was very passionate about his USC Trojans. Growing up, there was an ongoing rivalry, USC versus UCLA with some neighbors. And one year, when the Trojans lost to UCLA to go to the Rose Bowl championship, the neighbors up the street hung a dead black wreath saying, rest in peace, Trojans, on our post by the front door. When they went to the Rose Bowl game, my dad and some friends went to their house and took all of their Christmas lights off their home and then spelled USC with them on the top of their house so they would see them when they got home from the game. So yes, he was a prankster too. The best memories I have of my dad are of our summers growing up. He was the chief engineer surveying supervisor for the National Park Service in the buildings of campgrounds. Throughout my childhood, we would spend three months a year in a different national park living in a trailer. I love those times. He was less stressed and very happy during those trips. On the weekends, we would go camping and hiking, and I would go fishing with my dad. With the early mornings when the lake was like glass, and in the evenings when the fish would jump all around us. Being out on the lake with my dad in our kayak away from life and stress was so peaceful. We had such quality time spent together. My love of the mountains comes from those times we spent together. Not living locally presented many obstacles between us. He, Vi, and I were only able to get together a few times every year but those times were super special. We did talk often, sometimes daily, and our relationship over time strengthened, which I'm so grateful that we got the time to do that. I miss you, Dad. You're in my heart every day. I love you. Thank you, Tammy. And then some remembrances that come from uh, Ken's nephew, Jeff Cole. Jeff writes, the loss of a family member is never easy. One way to make it a bit easier is to recall all the great times we had together in the past. Uncle Ken, as far back as I can remember, the manicured yard and fruit trees, the pool parties at your house, the family occasions with our cousins, grandma and grandpa, and the whole gang. Your sense of humor was top-notch. 
your vision to be one of the first to put solar panels on the roof to heat the pool, your stock picks you shared with us, what you thought of the economy, how things were going worldwide, all these were an interesting story. We all learned from what you told us and now we can have those same conversations with our children and grandchildren. Then you introduced us to Aunt Vi and her great family. What a catch. Now the family parties at your house were even better. I recall on one occasion, someone brought up the topic of leg wrestling, which I had never heard of before. Dear Diana was anxious to explain it to me and give me a personal lesson in this unknown sporting ritual. When I was flipped, dazed and confused about what just happened, the room was very entertained. I think I even wanted to try it one more time because it had to be a fluke. A girl couldn't do that to a big strapping young lad. I was wrong. It was no fluke. I pulled out the white flag and surrendered. You and Vi were always interested in what Chris and I did on the ranch. We were proud to tell you our daily routines. Your visit was very special for us. The ranch tour, the Phillips Mansion tour, eating enchiladas at the famous St. James Hotel. After you returned home, hearing about Vi going to Vaughn's and buying ground bison for supper really made our day. We are all here a very short time. None of us are perfect, but as we navigate the ever-changing challenges of this world, I can't help but think how lucky, lucky we were growing up to have all these great memories of family. For that, I love you, and I thank you for being a big part of those great times. Aunt Vi, stay strong, as you always have been and always will be, a pillar of strength in this family. With much love to you, you both, Jeff and Chris. And I'd like to share just a couple thoughts as well. Uh, Tammy mentioned the rivalry that uh, Ken had because Ken went to USC. Well, I went to Stanford. And so on those one Saturdays of the year in the fall, when USC and Stanford played against each other, and I played for Stanford, um, there was a lot big rivalry at home because my mom was no longer a USC Trojan fan, but she was a Stanford Cardinal fan. And so we had some very interesting times as we would get together during the course of the year to talk about uh, which team was better. Also remember um, how much Ken enjoyed the pool. He built the pool there and spent a lot of time in it. And uh, whenever we would visit, we would spend a lot of time there in it as well. My last memory there of being in the pool was about a year and a half ago on one of the hot summer days uh, there in, in Glendora. And uh, Ken and I decided to go swimming and we must have stayed about two hours in the pool just because it was so hot, talking, sharing, and just uh, enjoying the time together. On many occasions, uh, we would talk and uh, I would listen, he would listen to what I had to share, and it was just a very uh, engaging time. And I appreciated Ken's wisdom, his intelligence. Uh, he kept up to date with, with everything that was happening in the world. And I'll miss those times that we had to uh, talk and share together. Well, Diana now is going to play another song familiar to most of us called Amazing Grace. and it summarizes probably more than any other song that I know of, the great amazing grace of God through Jesus Christ. Hi, I am Diana Murray Tudsbury. I am the daughter of Violet Schneider and the stepdaughter of Ken Schneider. This is Amazing Grace.
Life all around us seems to have lost its bearings. You may be like me in that every morning and evening I read or listen to the latest news about the coronavirus. Our world has never faced such a global pandemic before. And add to all this the previous almost daily reports about bombings and killings in parts of the world, and you have a world full of chaos. We truly are living in a tumultuous world. We don't know what is going to happen next and expect almost anything could happen. We feel the uncertainty of life and it's like a ship without an anchor in a storm being tossed all about. Funerals can be times that remember resemble a storm. A death is not usually anticipated or planned for. Even though Ken was not in great health, yet none of us expected his diagnosis and death to come as quickly as it did. It's in these uncertain times and painful times that we need something to help us through the pain and questions that keep swirling around us. We need something or someone to give us some stability and to anchor us to something that is firm. When life brings changes that are hard and painful, I find that I need to turn to those things that are unchanging and are like an anchor to hold me tight. In the book of Hebrews in the Bible, the author is writing to encourage Christians who have gone through some very tough times. They had been and still were being persecuted. Many had lost their homes or material possessions, and in their past, some had even been put to death. In the midst of this, the author of this letter reminds these Christians of their hope. We read in Hebrews chapter 6, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. God wanted to remind these Christians and to remind us that we have a hope that is like an anchor for our soul. And in a time of turmoil, that's exactly what we need. An anchor that holds on to the bottom of the ocean. And as long as the anchor stays attached to the ocean bottom, a boat can survive a storm. Let me mention three anchors that can not only give us hope, but also keep us secured to something solid. The first anchor is God. God is bigger than any storm. There are many features about God that I could mention that are important for us to remember during times like this, but two are especially helpful. The first is God's sovereignty. My own father died when he was 51. I was shocked because 51 is way too young to die. I asked God the usual questions. Why did this happen? Why did he have to die so soon? But I didn't receive any answers from God. Instead, God reminded me that he is sovereign. When I say that God is sovereign, it means that nothing happens that, are not, that is not part of God's will, although the Bible clearly says that God is not the author of evil and that God is loving and merciful. Holding on to the sovereignty of God means that while we don't always understand why things happen, we can put our trust in God knowing that he has all things under control and life and death are not events that randomly happen. We can trust him. A second helpful reminder about God is his presence. We need God's presence to reassure us that he is going to be there to help us through times of grief and trouble. The writer of Hebrews reminds these Christians of what God said to Joshua long ago when Joshua took over the leadership of Moses and was ready to lead the Israelites into the promised land. God said to Joshua, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The writer of Hebrews repeats this promise that God made to emphasize the same truth to these early Christians. He said in Hebrews chapter 13, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That promise is for us as well. God will be with us. What God means by telling us he'll be with us is that with his presence, he will give us all that we need to face the realities of life to make it whether it's a good time or a tough time like these times. Whether it is peace or strength or hope, he will give us what we need. It may be only one day at a time, 
but each day God will help you and give you what you need. So seek God and stay close to him. He is an anchor that can hold us strong and secure during this time. The second anchor that we have is the Bible. You know, death brings a lot of questions. What is death like? What happens to us when we die? How can I make sure I'm going to heaven? A lot of people have their own opinions about these questions, but we need more than opinions. We need truth. While we don't know all the answers, the Bible does supply us with answers to the most important questions that we do have. The Bible is an anchor because, as Jesus said in one of his prayers to God, your word is truth. And because the Bible is truth, instead of merely having an opinion or guessing about these things, we can know for certain. That's the assurance of truth. Now, this is greatly encouraging because we can trust the Bible to tell us the answers to questions that we would never know by ourselves. You might ask the question, how do I get to heaven? And the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You can know you will go to heaven if you believe that Jesus is the true and only Son of God who died for your sins. And what about those who have died before us? Will we see those people again? The Bible answers that question as well. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4 and says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Notice that the Bible says that Christians are not to be like those people who have no hope. People have no hope when they don't have answers. The Bible says that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. That means those who have believed in him and have become part of his family will return with Jesus when he comes back, and we will have a great reunion with them. And then the Bible ends this section with the return of Jesus this way. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. These words are like an anchor. They hold us securely in the midst of an uncertain life, and we can share them with one another to encourage one another and give each other hope. The Bible is full of truth and encouraging words that are like an anchor to our soul and that we need to hang on to so that we have this anchor firm and secure. The third anchor that we have is Jesus. There are many aspects of Jesus that make him a great anchor. One is who he is. He is the Son of God. He is also God the Son, fully God as a second member of the Trinity. That means that all the attributes of God himself his perfect holiness, deep love and mercy and compassion, his limitless power, are all equally present in Jesus. But what also makes Jesus great is what he did for us. He died for our sins. As the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, who was perfect and had no sin, became sin for us. Why? So we could have our sins forgiven. That is why Jesus was able to say in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The answer is to how can I get right with God? How can I have my sins forgiven? How do I get to heaven? All come down to the truth that it's because of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus is an anchor for our soul. I know that these days have been difficult ones for all of us, compounded by the coronavirus, and it is still going to be difficult in the days ahead, even when we get past this virus. For you, Mom, and for all of us who are grieving Ken's death, the future is going to be different now. Ken isn't with us anymore. What can help all of us is to hold on to these three anchors. Hold on to God, hold on to the Bible, and hold on to Jesus. 
They will help us be strong and keep anchored to what is secure, not just in this life, but in the life to come. Will you pray with me? Father, we now commit Ken to you, <clears throat> although we know he has already stepped into eternity. And we go forth from here. May you remind us of those things that made Ken special to us. May those things give us joy, strength, comfort, and peace in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you for the assurance that you are our anchor. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were resurrected and have conquered death for us. May you help Mom and all the rest of us who are family and friends during this transition and into the future. May you remind us to lean on you for support so that we will experience your grace in ways that are deeper and wider than our needs. As we face the future, give us the hope and strength to move ahead. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.